as we come to your preach word, God, we ask, Lord God, that you indeed just have your way. God, may we not only be hearers of your word, but even more so, may we be doers. God, I ask that you will have your way. Not my will. Not our will. But God, let your will be done. In Jesus' name. Take your seats. I want to thank Carlisha and the entire worship arts department for leading us into worship this evening. It's a sweet presence of God here. We just want to stay and maybe as we transition that maybe we'll understand what God is saying to us this evening. May we take it and apply it to our lives. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I know Sunday evenings is always a difficult evening to leave the comfort of our beds. I am speaking because I'm a living testimony. <laughs> you know, and coming back into Sunday, even this year, you know, I was, I was at Lord my bed. But I'm, I'm glad that we started back because there's a world that needs Jesus. And the, and the more we keep church shut, the more we give the enemy the space to do what he has to do. So thank you so much for joining. Tell, tell fellow church members, because the only way that we can see Jesus is in our lives, that people can see, but also come and be a part of a boy to learn and grow together. Amen? Since the beginning of this year, God, I think, is speaking to very, very clearly to us as an assembly. It's time to get back to basics. It's time to return to Bethel. The theme, as Pastor Drew alluded to, early this year was return to Bethel, the gathering. You know, and as we fasted, we saw Romans 12, verse 1 to 2, and not conformity to the things of this world, but coming back and be transformed. Again, back to that place where we seek God, and God is a holy God. Amen? God, our God is a holy God. He's holy. We cannot be in the world and in church. We can't be half and half. We have to choose ye this day who we're going to serve. And not only that, but go all out for God. And as I was beginning this message, I know I look across these last couple of weeks. God has spoken to me clearly this past week alone. Last Sunday, we had Evangelist Julie Holder about getting back to what our mission is at church, evangelism. And then you might add probably... Probably one of the most challenging messages I've heard for the year when Pastor Darrell Richards last week at Christ Yasa Family Church spoke very clearly to us as a fellowship as we engage the culture from the book of Jeremiah. If you missed those services, I would encourage you to go back and watch them. And then this past Wednesday evening, Pastor Danley, about talents, same thing that Evangelist Julie talked about about the importance of using our talents and, and be good towards our talents. Then Brother Orlando speaking about be too blessed and the importance of understanding our purpose in life. This week alone, God has spoken very clearly to us. I know that we've been in the Deeper Life series and we talk about sanctification, justification, and past did an excellent job this morning about regeneration. I learned about things about the old time days I didn't know before. I was, I was enlightened about pressing and washing and drinking board and that kind of thing. I, I learned some things. You know, but in terms of being regenerated in Christ. And as we continue along this path, I felt God wants, wanted me to remind us, as he reminded me, the importance of not getting complacent. The more we grow in God, it's easy to get comfortable where we are, even our spirituality. You know, we're here to say, you know what, God, I have dedicated half an hour of morning to you. I will do this for the next 20 years. But sometimes in that 20 years, we say half an hour is enough. And we say, you know what, God, 40 minutes is a little too much. And then we get complacent even in the half an hour. Yes, it's good. Yes, you spend time. But God, God has want us to, to go for more and go deeper. But are we so complacent that you say, you know what, God, 30 minutes is enough, and that's what I'm going to give. You see, complacency, we only look at it from a negative point of view of sin. But even doing good things, we can get complacent. And this evening, I want to 
speak about a very familiar character that we all know very well. I know him from since I was in junior church. And I wanted to connect this character to something that is very familiar with us in the West Indies. Whether we like it or not, we all are part of it or we know about it. The title of my message this evening is Samson, a West Indies cricket. <laughs> Samson, a West Indies cricket. Now, you see, everybody say, but you're laughing. So, you're actually the title is one that may stick with you. And I want to see, us to see how we can learn something from both of them and their stories. Now, we first see Samson in Judges chapter 13. Now, at this time, Israel once again did evil in the sight of the Lord. This was a repeated cycle for them. They would, they would be appear ready to do evil. They would cry out to God. God would hear them. God would bring somebody to save them. All be well for a period of time when that person is alive. For the moment that person died, for the person determined they were buried in the, in the ground, uh, was buried and the thing go over, they back again doing the same thing over again. It was a repeated cycle over and over. And this time, that was it once again. The Bible said the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And this time they oppressed it with the Philistines. But God sent them a judge who will help them. The Bible said that at this time there was a man for the day and night whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren. And she was barren for quite a while, but the Lord heard her cry and told her that at this time you will not be barren no more, but you will bear a son. But he, he gave the, her very specific instructions. Judges chapter 13, verse 4 to 5 states, Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and they do not eat anything unclean. You become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to touch by a razor because the boy is to be Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. At this time, when the instructions were given, they were only given to Manoah's wife, not to him. So when she went and told him, he was like, what, what are you saying? This, this doesn't make sense. So he prayed and said, Lord, send the person again and let me hear from myself. So God answered him, and the person came back, letting him know as an angel. And the angel gave him the instructions that he gave his wife. And therefore, Samson was born. And he would lead Israel through a very interesting period in their history. Now, we, as we see already, he was given particular instructions how he must live or what must he done. However, in Judges chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnah, and Samson had a wandering eye. But so Samson wandered and wandered and wandered, eyes to the left and to the right, they weren't straight, and saw a first time woman, and was very attracted to her, and said, this is the woman that will become more of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But the mother, the parents were like, Samson, she is not an Israelite. We want to marry Israelite. And Samson said, you hear me tell you? This is the woman that I want. I am going to marry her with or without your permission. Samson's mind was made up. But the Bible but said that the Lord, they, the, the parents did not recognize that the Lord was orchestrating an occasion where he would meet the Philistines at this time. However, on this way to Timna, Samson was attacked by a, long, a young raging lion. And the Bible said that as he was attacked, Samson he killed the lion with his bare hands. Now, I don't know about you. If I saw a lion, I don't think about killing that with my bare hands. I run in. Now, I can't run the lion, but I can run because that is my defense. I can't run too fast. I know I would die or death like that, but at least I died trying to get away. If y'all heard about me, then say he lived well. However, Samson destroyed this lion, from miraculous strength. The Bible spirit came upon him, and he tore, he tore the, the lion limb from limb. But guess what? He didn't tell his parents. Now, I'm trying to figure out how you kill a lion, all the sweat and part of the blood on you, and your parents, you don't tell your parents anything, but I guess he want to keep it close to his chest. 
So as he went along, he went and his parents and nothing happened. He went to the first time, saw the woman again that the parents didn't like anyway. And one led another and they got married. And that was that. Samson was happy. However, the Bible said that during this time as well, there was a feast. And there were 30 companions with Samson. Now, again, the Philistines were the enemy at this time. So, they already keep this feast. They had this feast, and the, and the Bible says that Samson gave them a riddle. The feast was the last seven days. Samson, I can make a deal with you. If you get the answer to this riddle, I can give you 30 pieces of clothing and fine linen. They say, we can't miss this deal. Well, 30 will be to one of you, but you can't be that smart. Tell me, riddle, we can agree. But Samson said, you know what? But there's a catch. If you can't get it, you got to give it to me. He said, you sure you want to agree with this deal? He said, yeah, we can agree with it. We, we can find it out. The Bible says the first three days, they had no idea what the riddle was about. They tried to pick the brain. They had Google that time. So if they had Google, they were going on Google. They couldn't find anything whatsoever to answer this question. So they said, you know what? This is what we're going to do. Samson's wife come. We're going we're gonna to use you. This is day three. Up to now, we ain't, we ain't get this linen. We ain't, we ain't get this riddle at all. We are not giving Samson our clothes. That's too much money. So you just begin to do. You can go to him, and you're going to find out the answer to this, to this riddle. If you don't go, and you don't find the answer, it's trouble. So the Bible says she went and, and start crying and saying, Samson, please tell me the answer. Samson, tell me. Samson, tell me. Samson, tell me. He said, I can't tell you. I haven't even told my parents yet. No, I'm not told my parents this, this evening. I didn't tell anything, but I told, I didn't promise myself I would not talk to my parents this evening. So we hear about parents. This is, the, this is the, the title. This is the passage. Not about them. Amen? And they, and they will say amen even now. You don't say amen, but I could talk about you then. So as they said, so he said, tell us. He, tell, he said, I didn't even tell my parents this yet. Then, well, why will they tell you? See, back in that time, parents were held in high esteem and honor. So if he didn't share it with them, he would not share it with her. But she continued nagging and nagging and asking and asking. He said, you know what? I can't take this anymore. This is the answer to the riddle. And the man was so smart. On the last day, when they know he couldn't give an answer, they said, we know the answer. And they told him the answer to the riddle. He was so vexed. He said, imagine I trust you. I tell you what it is, and you, be, you betray me. But as he got so vexed, he went and killed 30 men and take them clothes and give it to them. 30 men. That was how vexed he was. Thank God that I wasn't one part of 30 men. Cut my clothes and we're gone for my life. But that was what he did. I said, look, here, take them. And went back home so vexed. And the father of the bride thought that he was so angry with her that he didn't want to marry her anymore. So the Bible said that, that the father gave this bride, his Samson's bride, not any bride, the man that big and strong, took his bride and gave it to one of his companions at the wedding. You imagine that? You imagine you're at a wedding and you got, a best, you got your bride party. And something happened, you hear one, one, one your bride party got the person you're supposed to marry. That was what happened. And the Bible said a period of time came and he went back. He, I guess the anger subsided. You know, I love, love conquers all wrong. You know, it, 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 he said, no, I miss my wife. Let me go out to Timna and, and see my wife. The Bible said he got a young goat and he came and he went to Timna and he, he was going to your room. Like any other thing, and he was going. The Bible said, where are you going? He said, going to see my wife. But he married a woman. I had to give her all these clothes. But I guess he, he didn't tell your father that he killed people. But he gave all these clothes to my wife. I go in to see her. He said, where are you going? You can't go in there. You mean we can't go in there? He said, well, I thought you were so bad so with, with her. I gave her to one of your companions. He said, give it to one of my what? One of my who? Companions? And the mother said, I, ah, I got her, but you he know. I was vexed before. But I angry now. And the Bible says that in Genesis 15, it was at that moment that Samson took things up a notch. And not having a reason to get even with those things, he proceeded to catch 300 foxes 
tie their tails in pairs, fasten a torch to every pair of tails, light the torch, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. Burn up the shops with the standing grain, together with the vineyards and olive groves. When the Philistines inquired who the culprit was, was and found out it was Samson, and the reason behind it, they burnt both the father and the daughter and the household. Because that was green, that was money, that was their income. You mess with the people money, you have to die. That's a cruel way to die. But that's how angry Samson was. But the Bible said that he was so vexed when they killed the wife, and then that he killed more people. He was on a murder rampage. He was that's how vexed he was. And, and, and Samson felt invincible. I mean, that like you're doing all these things. Nobody could touch you. People could try and they would fail. So he felt that there was nothing that was too hard for him to conquer. And after such a heavy loss, the Bible said he went and camped in Judah. And the first time one knew he was, and went to find Samson. Because he said, Samson, you have to die today. There's a bounty on your head and we're coming to take it. And we see the reading in Judges chapter 15, verses 11 to 20. I'm reading from the New International Version, and it states, Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, We come to tell you what I hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agree, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached the heath, the Philistines came to him shouting. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him powerfully. The ropes of his arms became like shard flats, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Funny, a fresh draw born of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, If a donkey's draw born, I've made donkeys of them. That'd be a good tweet. Very good tweet. If a donkey's draw born, I've killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the draw born, and the place was called Ramalia. Because he was very thirsty, he cried to the Lord, Have you given your servant this great victory? Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and the water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So the spring was called En Hakori, and it's still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of Philistine. 20 years, he was invincible. 20 years. The enemy tried, and they failed. He killed a long lion. Killed men for, for clothes. Killed a thousand men in the valley. <laughs> Samson thought that there was nothing that was, could take him out. Who could challenge him? Who could defeat him? Many tasks, many people tried, and all of them failed. So at this time, if you were Samson, put yourself in Samson's shoes. Imagine you accomplished all of these things. You were asking yourself, who could really take me out? Who could? I could write a book of all the people that I beat. And all of them dead. So there's nobody to live to tell you. That shows that I am invincible. But in Judges 16, this very story took a different turn. It says, one day, Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night. At dawn, we will kill him, they said. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them off on top of the hill that faces Hebron. Sometime later, Samson fell in love. 
of a woman in the valley of Sorak, whose name was Elilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his strength, and how we can overpower him, so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Elias said to Samson, tell me the secret of your strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried up, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried up and she tied him with them. With men hidden in the room, she called out, Samson, the first things are among you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easy as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Samson said to Elijah, you have made a fool of me. I thought I could trust you. You lied to me. All the men he's saying, one in the different Come now, tell me how you can be tied, he said. If anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Elijah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with men hidden in the room, she called out, Sam, son of first things are among you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Elijah said, Samson, all this time you've been making a fool of me. And lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric of the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, the lion took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with a pin. Again she called him, Samson, the Philistines are among you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin and the loom with the fabric. Then she, then she said to him, this is where it get good. How can you say you love me? How? When you don't even confide in me. This is the third time you have made a fool of me. And have not told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she probed him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I'm a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength will leave me, and I'll become as weak as any of the man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair. So he began, so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then he called, Samson, the first times are among you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the first time seized him, gorged out his eyes, took him down to the Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. I've heard this story many times, like I said, even from during church. And I always asked myself, and the question always was, what was the reason behind Samson's demise? It's easy to say Delilah. Easy. But was Delilah the main reason? Number two, was Delilah the only reason? No. Now you may say to yourself, as long as you talk about the title is Samson and Westerners Crooked, all I hear is about Samson. 
No, this is where you have questions quickly. January 25th to 28th, 2024, was a very important time in the history of West Indies cricket. We have since embarked on another tour of Australia. It has always been a difficult place to tour. We have since been in Australia since 1997. 27 long years. Long, long, long years. To be honest, nobody expects them to win. If you fall for it, nobody expects them to win. If you don't follow, you already know, you know what? West Indies going to win away. It don't make sense. They always get beat. And here in the radio the sports news, West Indies get beat. And at itself, without nothing new, the customer get beat all the time. And with this team, nobody expected anything different. One of our very own Craig Braff was the captain. But the team was inexperienced. And to make matters worse, two of the players that you thought they would at least, I don't want to say do nothing big, but they thought that they would add some value to the team. Jason Holden and Kyle Mears. Said, no, we ain't touring. We won't go, we won't go play T20 cricket and make some money. T20 cricket is revolu revolutionary cricket forever. But one of the teams that in fact impacted the most is West Indies cricket. We never have a full team of players because the players going to make money. Now, if you sit and study, imagine you work for three weeks and make $600,000. What are you doing? You go and play cricket for three weeks. Not so. How, you, how much y'all want six hundred thousand dollars to raise your hand? Six hundred thousand dollars for three for three weeks of work. See, Sean got two hands up and two legs up. That's what it was. So, so say to yourself, all right, well, I can stay with this cricket for a year and get paid, you know, hundred thousand dollars, and go with three weeks and make six hundred thousand dollars. You can take these six hundred thousand dollars. That makes sense to me. So that was what Westies found themselves in. So at this time, once again, the tour happened and players pulled out. Now, West Indies cricket for many years was on top of the cricket empire. We have seen many creators come through West Indies. None more greater than our very own national hero, Sir Garfield Sobers, who many believe up to now is still the greatest creator the world has ever seen. Whenever people come to the Caribbean, at the midst of Gary, there's this all about him, and the people are fascinated about who he is, even now at his age. But West Indies cricket has come through a long history. From the early periods, they were called barefoot monkeys in the English press. A total insult. Studying history of, of, of I studied history at UE, and one of the things that I studied was the history of West Indies cricket. And it wasn't cricket itself, but the history and the culture behind it. And for that particular time, there was the article actually in the English paper of them, and they were had monkeys describing West Indies cricket. These men who left their homes to go to play a trade that they love were belittled and insulted in the front page of the English newspaper. In 1960 61, they tied, uh, it's probably one of the greatest test matches to ever play in Australia, the tie test match. No, it wasn't around in 1960, 1961, but I heard, it on the, I heard little things and the, and the clips on YouTube, and it was a fantastic game. During these early periods, there was Sagarfi Sobers, there was Wes Hall, Charlie Griffith, Frank Worrell, Everton Weeks, Clay Walcott, the Black Bradman, George Headley, Rohan Kanai, Alvary Valentine, the list goes on and on of these great men. Frank Worrell had such an impact on cricket that the, the, the series between West Seas and Australia the trophy is called the Frank Worrell Trophy. That's the impact he had on the people of Australia. In the early periods, and even in the 70s, the vaccines began to, to peak under Clive Lloyd. And you know, you think about it, they were beating Australia for one uh, period of time. And Clive Lloyd was saying, you know what? These people can't beat me so bad again. And he said, the way we could beat them is you've got to get ignorant fast bowlers. And then you saw Michael Holden, Andy Roberts, Joe Garner, and probably the greatest fast bowler of West Indies cricket, the late Malcolm Marshall, come up. And you had Lloyd and Viv Richards and Greenwich and Keynes and all these players. And West Indies peaked at the 70s and the 80s. When the, when the Cricket World Cup was first introduced in 1975, West Indies won it. And 1979. And they made it fun in 1983. Nobody could beat West Indies. My, my grandfather and my father would tell me that it wasn't a case where you 
You used to go sleep, ah, when you wake up, ask ah, how rest is win, boy. Now you wake up, ask ah, how rest is lose, boy. But that's, that's where we found ourselves. We were the peak and the pinnacle of cricket in the entire world. These small nations that made up the region produced some of the greatest creatures this world has ever seen. However, fast forward in January 2024, we have seen this already done one, one love in the series. And they were going to Brisbane. And that was the Australia time. That was their fortress. Nobody beat them there. We have seen this battle first. And surprisingly, scored 3 and 11. They didn't expect the minute to runs, but they made it. And some of these young, inexperienced people came and, and showcased their talent. Like Kevin Hodge and Joshua De Silva. And they limited Australia to 8 9. Nobody thought they, 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 they did that, but they did that. We had Zari Roach and Kimar Roach, sorry, Zari Joseph and Kimar Roach taking wickets. However, they didn't back the best second innings. Only a hundred and three. Setting Australia 215 runs to win. Everybody thought that they would get beat. Everybody thought, you know what, this game finished. Let me turn off the TV. And especially when a young sensation known as Shamar Joseph from Ghana is already injured already. Now, Shamar Joseph was one of those young boys who were experienced, inexperienced going to Australia for the first time. But he left Australia with his head held high because he did and performed above and beyond what anybody expected of him to do. So in the second innings, he got injured. He had a toe injury, could not walk properly, couldn't do anything properly. And he was the sensation. So people thought, you know what, we already done a bowler. Australia going to score 215 runs. We can't win. But to everyone's amazement, on the fourth day of that test match, which will be the final day of the series, people spotted Shamar Jones at the ground. He was still walking gingerly. And the doctor said, you know what, he could play. And in the middle of the first session, we saw Samar Joseph. At that time, Australia were well ahead above. They should have won. But something happened. I've asked the tech team to help me to show the video at this time. And we will see what happened at that time. He got two wickets up their sleeve. Two mistakes. Two bits of good cricket from the West Indies. And it's glory for them. Fine. He went for the Yorker, he missed his target, and Nathan Lyon, he's got it down to 25. Down. Down it went. That was an opportunity. Little touch there, a little under edge was there. He's done. There is Nathan he's done. Lyon's on his way. He's walking off. And Osiri Joseph does make amends. The silver does the deed. And the West Indies just need just one more wicket. Steve Smith takes him on. Oh, four bits. He gets four. Oh, oh, oh boy, that did rise off the shoulder of the bat. Shamar Joseph, an absolute cracking delivery. But Steve Smith, I think, wants some attention here. Umpire's saying, no, no. Gracious me, incredible cricket shot. The courage to go for that 140 k's an hour. Yeah, come on. Oh, now he's going to go for two, and I think he's going to get it because he's placed it perfectly, Steve Smith. We're into 10 to win. He's got to find a way to support Steve Smith here. I'd now like to welcome up the NRMA insurance player of the match, uh, but he is also the player of the series. For his seven for 68 today, 
and 13 wickets at 17 across the series, plus a 50 on debut as well. It can only be one man, Shamar Joseph. He receives uh, the Richie Benno medal as well. I must say, we had two words, you know, that inspired us in this last match. Mr. Ronnie Hope said we're pathetic and hopeless. So, my, so, so that was our inspiration. We wanted to show the world we're not pathetic. And I must ask him, are these muscles big enough for him? It's a fair response. Australia against the West Indies. Australia retain the Frank Worrell Trophy. Nobody gave them a chance. Not in Australia, not even in the West Indies. One man, Rodney Hogg, called them pathetic and hopeless. But they did what many great West Indian teams could not do. 27 years. You see, commentators were crying, people at Carl were crying in the background because they could not believe everything that had happened. And it didn't only impact us as a West Indian, but the entire cricketing world appreciated what had happened. But you ask yourself, 27 years, what took so long? What really happened? How did we move from being world champions in the 70s and 80s to now celebrating a win in Australia for the first time in 27 years? It could be for many factors. But I think one thing that is connected between Samson and West Indies cricket is one word, complacency. We have since thought we would be kings for, forever and ever. So nothing was put in place when the great men would go. Even once started to go bit by bit, there was still some kind of success. It was like, you know what? We're going to ride it out. But when all retired in the mid-1990s, West Indies cricket never saw its height again and has never reached there since then. How was Samson defeated? No one could defeat Samson. But Samson got complacent. He got complacent in his strength. And you think about it, what I was finding amazing about this story was that Delilah asked him so many times. He gave an answer. She said the same thing, Samson, the Philistines are among you. And nothing registered in your mind that you were being set up. Nothing connected. But you did it after time after time after time. Why? Because you got complacent. You thought, you know what? My strength will bail me out. Because some identity was found in his strength. So even when he told the truth, he thought he would get away. But did not know that the spirit of the Lord had left him. My encouragement to you this evening, and to me, and to us, let's not get complacent. You may say, no, well, as wrong well, as I'm doing certain things, I've been getting through, but we can even get complacent doing good things for God. Return to Bethel is, is a form of getting back to our first love. And sometimes even when we're getting back there, you know, we see we're making progress. We get even complacent in progress. And that could lead to some kind of stalling. If there are things in our heart and our lives that need to be getting rid of to go deeper in God, if we get rid of them. If we could be honest, we've all gone complacent probably in some form or fashion, somewhere in our Christian walk with God. But let Samson and West Indies cricket remind us that complacency could lead to destruction. Even though Samson went on and he went to defeat the Philistines and, you know, killed more in his death than his life, that lesson is still resonating within us. Whether you fall off cricket or not, we are all West Indians. And we know of West Indies cricket. We've seen the decline. And we could pinpoint that we got complacent. As Barbadians don't get complacent, even as we are probably the most advanced country in the Caribbean, maybe we don't get complacent and think that we have it all. In church, we go to a very great church. 
let's not get complacent even coming to church. Let's not get complacent in our spiritual lives, in our daily lives. And maybe understand, you know what, God, if I'm getting complacent, forgive me. Show me areas in my life where I can improve on so that I will not lose something that you have for me in the long run. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we come to you this evening, God, we are grateful for your word. God, we're grateful, God, that there are lessons that we can learn and gain from. God, when we see a story of Samson, we've probably read it so many times. And probably that we've gone to the point where we, let's say, we know what the story holds. But God, I ask tonight, Lord God, that we will not get complacent in our Christian walk with you. God, it probably is some things as we want to go deeper in you and, and return to Beth, Lord God, maybe in our journey, Lord God, in our pursuit of, re- of returning to holiness and righteousness, may we not get complacent. God, part if there are things in our lives that need to be removed, help us not to stall, but help us to do what you've called us to do. If you're called us to go deeper, help us not to be comfortable where we're at. But God, give us a hunger and a passion and desire, Lord God, to say, you know what? I am not content to where I am, but I want to go deeper and chase after you. God, wherever we are, we may be in our Christian world. May this message resonate within us. May we take it and apply it to our lives. May we never see Samson, our rest is great, the same way again. But may we see it as a lesson that we can learn. And say, God, you know what? I don't want to think that your spirit is with, is with, is with me. I don't realize that it's been gone. I don't want to find my identity, God, in, in my own strength, in my own understanding. I want to put my strength and faith in you. God, help, help us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Before you go, if there's anyone is here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and your first part of complacency is you need of a Savior. Christ came so that none would perish, but all would have everlasting life. If you are here and you want to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can indicate by your raised hand. We pray for this time. Anyone? Just know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we're all believers here this evening. But one of the next minute, if you, this message has impacted you, you want to talk to God for yourself. Whether you th- think you're there or not, or you think that there's some things you need to work on, you talk to God for yourself. Say, God, help me not to be complacent. And show me where I need to be. Show me what's going on in my life so I can give it over to you and not suffer the same fate that Samson or Restless Crusade has done. Amen? So give it that minute even now. God, thank you, God, for reminding us this evening the importance, God, of not getting complacent. And God, may we take it and apply it to our lives. We take it and tell others about it and encourage them, oh God, and not be complacent. But in this world, as we turn to Bethel, may we have a full pursuit of you. In Jesus' name.